The bell rings. The door opens to a little boy. It's the neighbor's quiet kid. There are signs of worry on his face. Something has happened. The homeowner rushes and frantically dials 911 to get some help. With the roar of sirens taking over the street, the police arrive within minutes at the scene of the crime. The police cars halt in front of a two-story house in St. John's. It is not a pretty sight. The officials do not have to make it through the door to get to the victims. A man is lying face down at the front door, blood soaking his shirt. An apparent gunshot wound on his body. They make it inside the house. No signs of robbery or break-in. As the officials reach upstairs, they find another body. In the bedroom, there is a man lying on the ground in the same way, a gunshot wound here as well. One of these men is 29-year-old Vincent Romero, the father of the little boy, Christian Romero. The other victim is the father's roommate, 39-year-old Timothy Romans. He came from San Carlos, and Vincent had rented him a room in his house. Both of these men worked the same job. They were employed at a power plant construction company. Who would have done this? Who would have robbed this eight-year-old boy of his father? No suspects and no DNA. Is this another dead-end case? The truth will shock you. Welcome or welcome back to another episode of Twisted Minds. My name is James and this is the case of Christian Romero a case that shook the entire United States. The city is stumped. St. John's, Arizona had not seen such a case in at least four years. This was a community where people knew each other and looked out for each other. Neighbors and acquaintances are brought in for questioning. No one seems to have any information on the murderer. The wife of Timothy Romans, however, seemed to have her eye on one person, Christian Romero, the little boy. She told the police that she found Romero to be suspicious. The police kept looking for a trail, any evidence that could point them to the killer. They did not believe Christian to be a suspect. How could an eight-year-old boy shoot his own father? There had to be someone behind this, someone very smart, someone who left no crumbs for the police to pick up on. Christian Romero was brought into an interrogation as a witness so he could give his account of the double murder. Two female police officers questioned him regarding the double killings, talking to him in a calm and kind voice, and they make him pledge to only tell the truth. If you're not honest with me, if you're not truthful, it's not going to look good. The little boy calmly started giving his account of the story to the police that day. He told the officers that he circled the block around his house five to ten times before he started walking toward his house. It was a ritual that he did on Mondays and Wednesdays as he waited for his mother to return, who worked till five o'clock. As he was walking up the street, he saw a white car speeding in front of his house. And then, as he got to the building, he saw Romans lying on the floor at the front door. He ran to check on Romans and then sped into the house searching for his dad. He kept calling for him as he searched for signs of life. He reached upstairs and saw his dad lying on the ground in the bedroom. There was a lot of blood, a puddle of it next to his head. His face was covered in blood and he touched the blood and got no response from his father. So he just sat and cried. He further explained that he did not go anywhere else in the house as he was just lying down next to him on the ground crying for 30 minutes. He then ran to a friend's house and confided in the friend's brother. As the other boy rang up his father to tell him the horrifying news, he and his friend called 911. Christian also mentioned that Romero had a truck that was parked in the driveway, and when he saw it, one of its doors was open. The little boy sitting cross-legged did his best to put on a brave face and calmly give the police officers a clear account so that they could get ahead on the case and find the killer or killers. They asked the boy if he knew anyone who could have carried out the killings. Someone who had something against his dad, a vendetta. The boy told them that while he does not have a name, he does believe 
that someone bad did this. He pointed his suspicions to some shady people down the street that, according to him, were bad people because they were often seen smoking and recklessly driving around the area in a blue car. The police pressed Christian for further details. In hopes of nudging his memory, they explained the workings of a gun. The officers describe how when a fire is hot, the powder also comes out of the barrel that settles on the shooter's clothes and hands. Then they asked if there were any gunshots that he had heard. The boy denied hearing any shots, saying that the killer might have been in the house when he fired the gun. After this, the boy said something strange. He told the police officers that he could have some of the powder on his clothes because those guys could have shot in the house and made some smoke, and I could have walked into it. Finding his answer a little mysterious, the officers asked him if they would find any gunpowder on his clothes. The boy was not sure about it, but he did not shoot any guns. Here's where things get even weirder. The officers nudged him for further details of using a hint of intimidation. If you shot a gun yesterday, it would be important that you told us that you shot the gun because we are going to find out, so we need to know. The boy, obviously scared, gave in to the trap. He quickly told the police officers that he thinks he might have shot a gun. When questioned further on the gunshots, he confessed that he made two gunshots. And also, he said the killers shot Romans twice. He further detailed that he shot his dad because he thought he was suffering after the incident. And he did not want him to suffer. So he eased his pain by shooting him. Then the officers jumped to the big question and calmly asked the boy, Did you shoot your dad? To which the boy replied, I think so. Did you shoot him because you were mad at him? Hmm. After I shot him once, he was still moving. I think I shot him again. He further went on to admit that he killed both of the men. He took a 22 caliber handgun and shot both of them twice. He admitted to getting in frequent trouble with his dad, especially for lying. This was beyond appalling. The boy, who had been brought in as a victim, just confessed to the killings. Two murders. They had in front of them America's youngest killer. No one was willing to believe that behind this ruthless killing was a little boy. No one could stomach the fact that a father became a murder victim because of his own kin, his own blood, his son. The whole city was in a state of utter shock and disbelief. He's scared. He's trying to be tough, but he's scared. This was not your usual hit and run. A crime too heinous for a small, neighborly community such as St. John's, Arizona to take in. An incident that left the world in complete shock. Carlos Diaz, a relative of Christian, commented on the case and expressed his state of shock at the incident. He was an active kid, a very nice kid. This is just shocking. Chelsea Hara Mio, the neighbor of the Romero family, expressed her thoughts concerned about the fact that the killer had been so close to her family. A mother, she must have been terrorized by the ordeal, thinking she might have compromised the security of her own dear children. My kids have played with him. He was a nice kid. I couldn't believe him. Christian's grandmother, Liz Romero, however, had totally different thoughts on the case. She had no trouble believing that it could be Christian. Apparently, when she was given the unfortunate news, she started angrily yelling the following words. I knew this would happen. They were too hard on him. I knew he did it. He spent the night in my bed cuddling up to me. I had a feeling he did it. If any eight-year-old boy is capable of doing this, it's him. Liz could not further comment on the case as she wanted the police to respect her privacy at such a trying time. She did, however, tell the officials that Christian's stepmother, who is living in their current house, also said the same thing about Christian. Apparently, she had a feeling that it was the boy. So, what is the story here? What made this eight-year-old kid want to kill his own father? Was he really the killer? 
Was there a history of abuse, physical torment, or emotional neglect? Was it really planned or something that just happened? Christian's mother and Vincent had split up long before. Romero had been married since then and had custody of Christian. Christian's biological mother, Erin Bloomfield, was still an active part of his life. As the police further investigated the details of the crime, they found that the first victim was Vincent Romero. The date was November 5th. It was around 5 p.m. Vincent Romero was heading up to his sanctuary, going upstairs when he got hit. Christian shot his father twice. He aimed for the head first and then moved down toward his chest. Around this time, Timothy Romans was outside the house on the porch, talking to his wife on the phone. The hunting rifle did not make a big bang. It only made a soft toned down popping sound, making it very possible that the Romans had no idea what was happening inside the house. After shooting his father dead, Christian made his way toward the Romans as he called out his name. Romans told his wife that the boy was asking for him, so he made his way into the house. As he set foot in the house, Christian shot him twice, once in the head and once in the chest, just like he had done to his father moments earlier. The police received the call from the neighboring house at 5.08 p.m. and arrived at the scene a minute later. By then, both men had expired. Christian was considered to be a witness, as they believed he had discovered the two bodies. He was not taken into immediate custody. He was brought to the police station by his grandmother to be questioned on the case. Even the police had trouble coming up with a sure answer, determined to find a reason to justify the boy's acts. They believed that there was something that drove him to kill. It was not an impulsive decision on his part. Police Chief Roy Melnick spoke to the press. I'm not accusing anybody of anything at this point, but we're certainly going to look at the abuse part of this. He's eight years old. He just doesn't decide one day that he's going to shoot his father and shoot his father's friend for no reason. Something led up to this. The police rummaged through previous records and found no complaints with Arizona Child Protective Services. The records showed no disciplinary actions or incidences. The boy had never shown any bad behavior. He had never gotten into any trouble prior to this. We're going to use every avenue of the law that's available to us, but we're also looking at the human side. The investigators first thought that the boy must have experienced something very traumatic. The psychologists were also of the mind that in the extremely rare cases that something like this happens, it is often a result of some emotional or physical torment. So they kept searching for any records of sexual trauma or physical abuse. They found nothing. That's what makes this case somewhat puzzling. Our goal is to get some help. Usually in the cases that a child kills a parent, the child is a teenager. And according to psychologists and behavioral specialists, a child acts in such a way for three main reasons. Firstly, the child suffered through years of mental or physical torment. Second, the kid is diagnosed with some serious sort of mental illness. The third reason is some kind of personality disorder, sociopathic tendencies and frustration. They just wanted to find which of the reasons matched with Christian. The judge set on finding the underlying cause ordered a psych evaluation to get more details on the matter and gain insight into the mind of the young killer. The case turned out to be much tougher than one would have expected from such a little town. There was one problem with the psych evaluation. The boy was so young that it could be due to anything. It could be an immature decision, something he learned from a violent video game or his favorite action movie and decided he should give it a go. It could have been a mistake, an act of impulse, there were so many possibilities, so many ways to look at it. Having grown up in a family of avid hunters, Christian was no stranger to guns. In fact, his father had taught him how to use a gun and to make sure he wasn't afraid of them. 
they would go out and hunt for prairie dogs. Little did the father know that this would quite literally backfire on him. Psychologists believe that his gun training might have played a part in this murder case. After all, he did use a single action 22 caliber hunting rifle to shoot these two men. This is not your typical gun that requires one load, and you can go on an impulsive shooting spree. You actually need to remove the shell from the rifle after each shot and put in a new one, and that is what Christian had done. It does not seem like the boy was much of a talker. However, he did give some hints in the police interviews that were conducted afterward. Christian told the police that he was often the subject to spanking. In fact, the night before the shooting, Vincent had spanked the boy five times because he had forgot some papers at school. During the inspection, the officers found some papers that seemed to be ledgers. The boy kept a record of his spankings. And while he did not communicate his feelings, he penned them down. The latest document also uncovered some useful information. It was discovered that Christian told a Child Protective Service officer that his 1,000th spanking would be his very last. And the tally that they found had reached exactly 1,000. The boy's attorney, Ron Wood, said that on the day of the killing, he made a decision to either get himself killed or kill the two men. The behavior of the boy and the information regarding the case pointed to one conclusion. It was not an impulse. It was not a spur of the moment kind of thing. It was calculated. It was a motivated homicide. He had planned to shoot his father. With the emotional complexities of the case, along with the legal aspects, the police wanted the boy to be tried as an adult. The boy was too young to be put behind bars otherwise. When a youngster is convicted as a minor, they are sent to a juvenile detention hall until they reach the age of 18. Christian was not eligible for a life sentence as he was under the age of 18. In 2010, after a 14-month deliberation cycle of whether or not the boy had the mental ability to grasp the intensity of his crime and understand the legal repercussions, the case came to a conclusion. The charges were resolved with a guilty plea to the count of negligent homicide of Timothy Romans. Keeping in view the future of the boy, the judge decided that the charge for the murder of his father should be dropped. The boy would be brought into a foster home until his 18th birthday. He would then be kept in a treatment unit where he would continue to get treated until he reached the age of 21. It is hard to find more details on the case as it has been restricted. A gag order was put on the case preventing any attorney, police officer, investigator, or agency from giving out any details of the case to the general public. The press is not given a face to the name due to his age. The boy is set to be released on his 18th birthday. Some say that if the boy is capable of a crime of this caliber, he is capable of anything. And hence, he is still a danger to society. He should not be released into the world, as he will act on his dark desires once again. In the words of Michael Whiting, the prosecutor, based on the reports I've read, based on the things that have gone on since the time of the murders, I don't think we can say, yes, he is safe. He'll be fine in public schools. No worries whatsoever. What are your thoughts? Do you believe that a boy at such a young age of eight is capable of murder and lying about it? Thanks for tuning in to Twisted Minds. That was the case of Christian Romero. And why don't you go ahead and click on one of the two videos on your screen for another one of our videos.